Washington Post article, Corey Robin, a sympathetic reporter at the time at the Post, recounts his interviews with the two dons, that's his phrase, the two dons of the neoconservative movement, William F. Buckley Jr. and Herbie Christie. A long quotation that I'm going to give you now will end my discussion of this cabal. Okay, so everything I now give you is Corey Robin, and embedded in that are his citations from both Buckley and Christie. This is 2004 in Washington. Quote, the trouble with the emphasis in conservatism on the mark, Buckley told me, is that it becomes boring. You hear it once, you master the idea. The notion of devoting your life to the mark is horrifying, if only because it is so repetitious. It's like sex. <laughs> It's importantly revealing <laughs> uh, Crystal, this is, this is the post article continues. Crystal confessed to a yearning for an American empire. Quote Crystal, what's the point of being the greatest, most powerful nation in the world and not having an imperial role in the first nation? The article continues. But because of its devotion to prosperity, Crystal added, the United States lacks the fortitude and vision to wield imperial military power. Quote again, it's too bad, Crystal laments. I think it would be natural for the United States to play a far more dominant role in the world, to command and to give orders as to what is to be done. People need that. There are many parts of the world, Africa in particular, where American authorities willing to use troops can make a healthy difference, end quote. The article continues. But not with publication, not with uh, public discussion dominated by accountants. Crystal again. There's the Republican Party tying itself into knots. Over what, he asked. It's disgusting that presidential politics of the most important country in the world should revolve around prescriptions for old people. End of all this. Now, they introduce the question of character. One can easily imagine how, in the face of such attitudes, values, and characters, Henry Adams, as Pat Horitz laments, would think American society, morals, and politics needed lucid exposition and indeed loving criticism. Henry Adams worries Pat Horitz and the other neocons not because of his political positions, which were against the Philippine War, against the occupation of Cuba, against the high tariff, and etc. Nor does his critical attitude worry them as such. But Hartz goes out of his way to disgrace Henry, after all, by citing his great-grandfather John Adams against him, making Henry into a lost sheep, a prodigal, departing from the American family outside the filiative line of proper descent. Given that Bahartz and Crystal regularly stress their own immigrant lower-class Jewish origins, one should be a bit distressed that Bahartz cynically attacks Henry Adams for failing the Mandarin inheritance of his own family. What matters, of course, is not Henry's departure from his fathers, but his departure from the paternal line of Americanism that the neocons claim is their own birthright. Stepping aside from what America had become after the Civil War, first to reform it and then to expose and criticize it, those are the unforgivable gestures of a prodigal. The neocons direct us politically to the question of education and formation. So I'm going to play built on that space. And to discuss these questions in the US tradition requires attention to the education of Henry Adams. But Hartz makes the effort to lessen its status because the book offers the best account of how one forms oneself in the United States in order not to say such things as Buckley and Crystal feel at home to say. Famously, Adams insists that he never found the education he needed. Yet as Kirk so clearly puts it, Adams is probably the best educated and most learned person in US history. Set aside, please, all the relativizing cliches that rush to mind in the face of such a statement, and consider its rhetorical political value in our context. The neocons will not tolerate any human formation that produces a hostile criticism of American culture, politics, or society. This is why I think they place themselves within Mahan's school that advances exterminism as a legitimate form of state policy. Formation, as my colleague Ronald Judy always points out, is as much a matter, in his studies of Gramsci and Du Bois, is as much a matter of Bildung as it is social context. Indeed, there are, these are inseparable. Adams launches the education, he 
remember retrospectively. He was aware that these strange circumstances of his birth an 18th century person born in 1838 on the verge of the 20th century, that's how he puts it, disqualified his character, <clears throat> Henry, that is the character inside the text, from playing a major public role in the US. It did place him, Adams, whoever that is, however, in the perfect position to stand athwart what the US would become, able to compare it by study and experience to other societies and forms, expose it, think it lucidly, and offer judgments on various forces and elements. He does all this while loving the country and its democratic experiments, even while struggling with various contradictory tendencies within his own feelings on its development. Of the character Henry, Henry Adams, the author of the narrator writes repeatedly that he experimented and failed at education. Mostly each thing he carefully learns ends up being late, and Adams exists delatedly, as a figure always behind the world in which he lives, and which, by definition, he can never learn. To create such a character so carefully posed against that for which education can never arrive, Adams has to occupy the position he denies his character. How else to know what education denies? Adams' own formation is what threatens the neocons. The education's narrative shows that the proper intellectual formation for living in and lucidly grasping the US requires a double turn. First, there is the inevitable discovery that America always moves too fast for even recently acquired education to fit the circumstances one needs to understand or lead. Check Barack Obama. Second, there is the necessary discovery that measuring the failure of education provides proper access to that which we need to learn. Adams' modernity consists first in how he forms himself, emphasizing as many do the privileged traditional nature of his development misses the point. Privilege is a mark of any socially stratified society, largely uninterested. With a figure as intelligent and critical as Adams, it is not definitive. Adams is modern, and here I'm going to again thank Professor Weisberg for helping here. Adams is more modern as Karl Krauss was modern, at least on this point. Walter Benjamin, in his definitive 1931 study of Krauss, notes how essentially agonistic educational formation must be if it is to serve the individual and by creative critical work of the society. Like Adams who studied his Wordsworth, Wordsworth, Krauss had an uncanny ability to imagine, and here I quote uh, Benjamin, uh, in uh, the Harvard translation, each fiber of childhood, he had the un uncanny ability to imagine each fiber of childhood with all its manifestations uh, so intensely that the temperature is raised in the Benjamin quotation. Near the opening of the education, Adams recounts how one morning at the ancestral home in Quincy, he rebelled against his mother and refused to go to school. His grandfather, former president of the United States and current congressman, uh, his grandfather, hard at work in his second floor study, silently and without explicit judgment, comes down the stairs, takes the boy by the hand. The boy thinking, all the while, I certainly can break away from this 83-year-old man at any time. Takes the boy by his hand and defying all odds, walks the boy safely to school, preventing his escape into Tom Sawyer-like games of warmth. The world insists on schooling the boy, but the boy, retrospectively as it were, learns from his rebellion a lesson in education no schooling could provide. Lessons about power, forbearance, mental and emotional balance, the gendered nature of domestic power, and so on. But most important, he learns that education comes from being firmly against schooling. Benjamin puts it nicely when discussing Krauss. I quote Benjamin once more. He, Krauss, never envisaged the child as the object of education, rather in an image from his own youth. That actually is Bilbo, but Jeff, Jeff translates it as education. Rather in an image from his own youth, he saw the child as the antagonist of education, who was educated by this antagonist, not by the educator." In 1858-59, just 20 years old and a recent Harvard graduate, Adams set out on a grand tour of Europe that began with a visit to London but had studied in the Humboldt University as its supposed goal. There, Adams was to read law and observe the most advanced research university in the world. 
Surprised by his difficulties with German, a language that always eluded this polyglot intellectual, Adams attended a gymnasium to acquire the language like a schoolboy. He wrote articles for American newspapers on German education, and in his book, The Education, summarized the general lesson learned, and I quote him, I can say that I'm new to this idea of the time limit, and I can, you can stop me in 10 minutes or you can let me finish. That's up to you. <laughs> Just so you know. Uh, he wrote articles for American newspapers on German education and summarized it this way, quote, all state education is a sort of dynamo machine for polarizing the popular mind, for turning and holding its lines of force in the direction supposed to be the most effective for state purposes, end quote. London provided education, of course. It came from theater, opera, ballet, and beer halls, quote him again. The curious and perplexing <coughs> result of the total failure of German education was that the students was that the student's only clear gain, his single step to a higher life, came from time wasted, studies neglected, vices indulged, education reversed. It came from the despised beer garden and music hall. It was accidental, unintended, and unforeseen. End of quote. This is hard for us as pedagogues. The educated human subject could not result from the planned application of force through state institutions. The alternative to state institutions, I rush to say, is not, of course, so-called American private education at university or charter school. We know though, that these ought to be what Althusser long ago taught us to call ideological state apparatuses. Their independence from the state and illusion generated by mediation. The alternative to state education is also not civil society or the formal aesthetic institutions. These are rather possible fields for an active intellect, for a concerned imagination, a critical mind. The basic opposition for Adams is state directed, and I quote, accidental, unintended, and unforeseen, end quote, for they each imply a differently formed subjectivity, a political process of subject formation. The education insists that anticipatory intelligence is rare, especially in America. I have argued elsewhere that Adams thinking about intelligence, so the Adams essays of critical inquiry. I have argued elsewhere that Adams is thinking about intelligence is similar to Aristotle's notions of active intelligence, and so to various Arabic followers who built on his work. There are two reasons why it is so rare in America, and they are opposite sides of the same coin. First, as I've said, America changes rapidly as the principal place of modernity. It cannot catch up to its own formation. Second, as a formation, it values neither the education that might ameliorate that belatedness, nor the intelligence that might understand and exposit. Being accidental, however, the resulting education is better suited to regard, study, and question than a directed education that creates a subject at home, placed within systems and processes it cannot understand, and more important, sees no need to understand. The alienation effects achieve real education, but in nature, they direct the subject toward aesthetics, towards mere beauty and the fringes of power. Travel brought the young Henry to a critical insight about the state and its plans for subject formation. Travel carried him through what he called, quote, tropical islands, mountain solitudes, archaic law, and retrograde types. No matter what these taught, inevitably, they drew the traveler back to consumption, to aestheticization, to unsatisfying mere sensuality. They left, quote, a certain intense cerebral restlessness, end quote, that deceived Henry into imagining that mathematics 